Good morning, good morning. Good to see you this morning. Come on, let's stand up and worship the Lord together this morning. job church you got the clapping and praise thing going down you've grown so much and proud of you 
Um, I am excited for this opportunity to say welcome to Three River Church. You're visiting with us. We're so happy to have you here today. We have a communication card. We'd love for you to fill that out so we can find out more about you and how we can get you connected with the church. If you're looking for a church home, you have found a church home. And we'd love for you to uh, grow with us in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ here. On the back is a vast expanse for you to put prayer requests and let us know how we can be praying for you, your family, celebrating with you as prayers have been answered and God is moving in your life. Amen. We also have lots of things going on. Uh, this week, just to remind you, we have uh, men to men and women to women uh, on Monday night. Uh, we have a small group on Thursday night and Friday night. That is in the... Um, the current. Thank you. There's it's another name that wants to come out every single time. And we also have, I want to draw your attention, the church office will be closed this week. Um, this seems crazy, but it is upon us. Save the date, children's Christmas party is coming up December 1st. Uh, tis the season. Are you ready? Hmm. Is it, like, like, let us get through the Thanksgiving first. It's about to happen. So it's going down quick. Things are moving quickly. Operation Christmas Child. Uh, for the month of November, the reminder is that they're collecting donations for the shipping. You just put that in the envelope. Make sure you mark that shoebox shipping. Amen. Mm -hmm. We just... Hey, Thanksgiving service this afternoon. Thanksgiving service this afternoon. Uh, that is the St. Mary's Waterfront Park Thanksgiving service. What time is that, Zane? Four o'clock. Four o'clock at St. Mary's Waterfront. That's a community Thanksgiving service. Uh, our band will be there, and I think uh, Pastor Ian is going to be bringing the word. Amen. You'll need to bring your chair. You'll bring, you <laughs> had to bring your own chair or stand or sit on the dirt or sit on the ground. <laughs> Any other announcements? <laughs> awesome. Um, this is one of my favorite times of year, and it is because it is the football season. <laughs> and I know there are many uh, fans in the room, and there are many non fans in the room. Uh, but what is amazing is the amount of emotion and toil and strife that goes through a football fan. Uh, you can see it on their countenance. If they're, if they're team one, they're walking around, chest is out just a little bit, smiles a little bit bigger, their team is not doing good, or if their team is having a terrible season, not just a bad game, but the whole season's over, they're like, well, there's always next year. It's amazing how that impacts us. And it's a temporary thing. Mm -hmm. But we just sang some words about amazing grace. And in that song, it said that you would take my place, yeah. that you would bear my cross. So what has us all here together this morning is one common thread. It's not our football team. That's right, it's not our love of football or displeasure of all sports. It's nothing that is temporary. It is one thing, and it is Jesus Christ. We were a certain way, lost and without hope, and someone arranged an encounter with Jesus Christ. And after meeting him, we have been changed and will never be the same. And Jesus has called us to not just have salvation through our faith in him, but he's put us on a mission to share the message of hope the good news that we're fixing to read about and we get in December that he is the good news and we have an opportunity today because God has given us today to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ to be the ambassadors of the cross and to share the good news of Jesus Christ so we're here today to worship to celebrate but also to equip ourselves because when we leave here today we will continue the worship we'll continue the praise but we have a mission that we need to be excited about, feel confident about, and know who it is that we live and serve. Amen? Mm -hmm. Father, we come before you. Lord, we just thank you so much for the opportunity that we have today to worship you in such freedom. Lord, may you drive everything out of our mind and heart that is in the way. Lord, whether that is emotions, feelings, thoughts, worries, Lord, we put all those to the side. And we put our full affection of our mind and heart on you and your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we want to worship together in one voice. Lord, we want to lean into your word today. We want to learn, we want to grow, and we want to take what we understand and put it into action into our lives so that we not only share the gospel with our mouths, but we live it out 
with our actions. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace all my fears relieved. Oh, how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Now my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And now like a flood, His mercy reigns on it. Oh 
I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom. I'll go ahead and be seated. transition than normal. We've got something special and uh, perhaps strange. One, two, three, four, five. So we said bring five chairs up. Apparently we can't, uh, somebody uh, counted better on the fly. Uh, I mean, if you want to sit up on uh, up here today, that'd be fine. So today what we're going to do is something a little bit different. So uh, pictured from left to right, this is Bruce Redding. He is one of our elders and, you know, Pastor Zane. There's Pastor Mark. There's one of our elders, Randy Hendricks, and one of our elders, Nick Piljay. I'm Pastor Ian. So what we are going to do today, we have concluded our verse-by-verse -verse exposition in the, gospel, in the uh, letter to the Colossian church. And so what we decided to do is we decided that we would each preach about a, a, a short uh, short time on the verse that most spoke to us or that was uh, most meaningful to us throughout the series and we're each going to do that, and we're going to start with, uh, with Elder Nicholas Piljay. And then at the end, if we have time, we're going to do the very dangerous thing and open it up for completely random questions about the letter to the church at Colossae. So if you have questions and, you know, we didn't answer it through our 18-week series, this will be the time to do that. So without further ado, Nick, Nick has the privilege of going first. Be friendly. Is it is it all downhill from here? No, it's all okay. here, brother. All up here. Good morning, guys. So this is uh yeah, this is new. So so bear with me here. Um, so I'll start off with a story. So uh, sorry, I mean I'll, I'll get a little closer here. So well, my family was in vacation in uh, South Carolina this past summer. And while we're up there, we visit another church. Um, first, let me say how thankful I am of our pastors and our church family. Uh, if you guys have ever visited another church, it seems like, seems very foreign when you've grown used and accustomed uh, to, to your church family. So I appreciate uh, everybody here so much. Um, so the church that we visited, it turned out to be an actual satellite church. There was like seven churches that were there. Uh, that were within this church, and we sat down, and uh, the the worship team played, and then they dropped down a screen, and then we received a message that was pre-recorded on a screen, which that was uh, that was that was different. It was kind of hard to to kind of um, uh, to get used to that to make a connection with somebody on a screen, uh, and yet here we're blessed with three pastors, right? So. Uh, uh, so that was different, but one thing that I did like that they did was their order of service, and um, and what they did there is something that we actually have adopted here, and you guys, I'm sure, have noticed the change. So we, uh, as we, you know, as you know, we start here, we play our two songs, and then Pastor Zane always gives Pastor Mark the nod, so he knows when he's got to come up and give the welcome, and uh, and then after he does the welcome, we play two more songs. But the major change now is that we play the two songs after the message with our whole band. And the reason I liked that was because I really felt a connection with the message that was being shared as we sang two more songs that were correlated specifically uh, with what the pastor had shared. It felt very intentional. 
Um, not that we weren't intentional but before. Um, I think we do a very good job of making sure that we sing scripturally sound songs here at Three Rivers. Uh, but before I send the songs out to the worship team um, and for them to prepare for the service, now what I do is I read the passages that our pastors are going to be preaching on. I study them and I pray for some guidance. And, uh, and because of that, it's been such a blessing to me. It's actually allowed me to dig so much deeper into the Word and actually be prepared for the message every Sunday morning. And one of the weeks as I was preaching, or excuse me, I wasn't preaching, they were preaching. One of the weeks I was preparing uh, for the, what songs we were going to select, I, this, this particular passage in Colossians stuck out to me, which was Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. And it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And that really connected me, especially with this kind of new, um, new journey that I was on. Uh, I was doing it to um, switch things up, and uh, I thought it was neat and exciting, and I, and I liked how it connected, but it ended up turning to be such a more of a blessing for me, uh, just because, like I said, I was able to dig into God's Word and, and find these songs. Um, is allowed me to study his word and make a deeper connection with the songs that we sing on Sunday. Some weeks are a little bit more challenging than the others, especially if we get into some genealogy. I'm not quite sure what we're going to sing when we get to some genealogy. So, okay. <laughs> and Zane, Zane, Pastor Zane always tells me, don't think about it, just sing about Jesus. Just pick songs on Jesus. So, um, and he's right. But the process of doing this, the verse, uh, this verse in Colossians that I read happens to me every week now. And I read his word, I study it, I find biblical songs that speak on the same topics, I listen to them, I find new songs, and as a result, I'm immersed in his word. And these songs, they get stuck in my head all day because they have catchy melodies, but as a result, his word gets stuck in my head. And it dwells in me, and it teaches me. I feel like you right now. <laughs> uh, and when, when I prepare at home and I practice these songs, my kids hear them and they sing along, and teaching moments come from that. And I pray that the same happens for you all. That these songs we play, they're not just songs. I pray that I pray that they get stuck in your head and the word dwells in you. And not only that, but that it teaches you, it instructs you, it puts it, and you put it to mind, you memorize it. And as a direct result of that, I pray that it pours into your children, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors. I pray that by your obedience, it pours out to all of them. And just think about how easily a song gets stuck in your head. I, I can remember all the lyrics from songs I listened to when I, was, when I was a kid, songs I probably had no right listening to when I look back today, but I can recall those lyrics still. And think about how damaging that can be. So, so let that, that let's be a warning to you. Like, guard your ears, guard your heart. We, we immerse ourselves with music on a daily basis that contains lyrics that do not glorify God. We listen to these songs, and we memorize them, we memorize the words, and we play them over and over in our heads on the, on the car rides to, to school. Our kids hear them, and, and they blindly sing these lyrics that glorify the word. So listen, listen to songs that glorify him. Um, and, I, and I pray you sing these songs with thankfulness in your hearts for what God has done for us, what we do not deserve. But what an incredible gift God has given us, this gift of song. So I'm thankful that he has blessed me with the talent to play a musical instrument, especially if Zach gets called into work and I gotta play a couple of them up here, it's, uh, it gets a little bit stressful, but I, I'm thankful that he's blessed me with this talent, uh, and I'm even more thankful that I can use it uh, to, to glorify him. So I'll end with this, is, is whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do I use
use the word eldest? The oldest. You can tell by my hearing aids and, uh, and by the gray on top, but because I grew up in a different era, I'm going to be using different words that, uh, that maybe a lot of y'all uh, don't understand, but thanks a lot, dude. I wasn't going to get that deep. <laughs> Man, how do you follow up uh, when, when the word touches somebody's heart and, uh, and they speak it from the heart? Um, so when Zane mentioned yesterday, because I didn't hear, because of my hearing age, and because I was out last week that uh, we we're going to be doing this this morning, um, it's interesting because that, that last minute instruction is exactly what I wanted to, uh, to talk about this morning. Uh, Brother Ian mentioned that, uh, you know, take a verse, you know, that meant something to you. And I'm not going to take a verse that means something to me, but a concept, and that is special or final or further instructions. Um, recently, I was going through uh, <laughs> some of my parents' personal stuff. Um, my dad passed away, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, and my mom is in a, um, is in a memory care center. Uh, she's been there for a couple years, and it gets tough because, you know, when you go to see your mom and, uh, and she doesn't know who you are, um, yeah. So I was at the house, um, maybe here a couple months back, looking through some of uh, their personal uh, belongings, keepsakes, uh, looking for titles to vehicles, uh, things that, you know, we, we, we're trying to get prepared for, you know, when the, when the worst happens. Um, I ran across some, uh, some letters um, that my dad had sent um, to mom and us boys when he was uh, at war in Vietnam, um, way over, where is Vietnam? Way over yonder, different country, I mean, yeah. And uh, back in the day, you know, when, uh, when letters were actually written, stamps were placed on them and they got dropped in the mail. Um, and it, you know, in this place, you know, it took two weeks, maybe longer, you know, for that message to get to them. Um, most of you probably don't understand that because you can text somebody and get an instantaneous message or email and get uh, you know an immediate response unless you're a grandpa messaging your grand your children you know then it takes a while or um, unless you're a male spouse and your wife complains that uh, she should have never got you a smartphone because you don't use it to stay in touch with her anyway you know what I mean so um, I was reading these letters, and, and by the way, this is my emotional support notes. I need those. I get nervous. I get lost. I get sidetracked. My, um, my dad had sent uh, this letter, and even though a majority of the beginning of the letter, you know, talked about things that he was going through, hazards of, you know, the battle, uh, hopes that everybody was doing well, um, sending his affection, his love. Uh, uh, you could always tell when the letter was getting ready to wrap up because even though the other stuff was important and needed to be said, he always gave those final, <laughs> last-minute, special, um, further instructions. Like, um, and I was reading this stuff, and it, uh, yeah, I was reading this stuff, and he said, boys, he said, like, um, listen to your mom, you know, say your prayers, do good in school till I come home. Um, I was five years old at the time, so I probably heard these things from my mom, but, you know, uh, until I read them, saw them. good for your mom, say your prayers, do good in school till I come home, daddy loves you. Paul did the same thing, um, I say in concept, um, uh, in the fourth chapter of, uh, of Colossians, even though everything that he had spoken before was important, was necessary, um, the believers, you know, at Colossians needed to hear these things, um, he still had 
the letter was getting ready to close. Uh, it, it probably was going to take a lot longer for that letter to get to him than the one going to Vietnam or that the cell phones or the emails, you know, were going to get to you or me. And so further instructions, last minute instructions, special instructions, hey, all this is important, but remember this. And in verse 1, or in verse 2, and he instructed the Colossians to devote themselves to personal prayer. It was specific to those Colossians, the recipients of the letter. And in verse 3 and 4, specific to Paul and those in ministry with him, and you remember the names, um, I don't, there's like seven or eight of them as you read the, the final chapter that he was, he was saying you were there with him, um, that were a benefit to him in ministry, ones that he was sending to them with the letter um, for help uh, to explain the precepts. Um, but he specifically asked for prayer for himself and his fellow ministers, his, his co-laborers, um, that under his specific circumstance where he was specifically at at that time, that they, him and his co-laborers, co would have the opportunity to speak just the right message in just the right manner to just the right people as God himself orchestrated it. Okay? And in verses 5 and 6, he then went on to instruct specifically those Colossians um, the recipients of that letter on how to make their similar specific opportunities profitable. Now, after reading all that, not just one verse, but that, that, those final instructions, um, I believe that that though we're not Paul, or one of those in ministry with him at that specific time under those specific circumstances and that we are not those Colossians that were receiving that specific letter at that particular time that there are concepts, no, there's precepts that are specific to us, meaning that, that the word that is written and there's a lot of verses that talk about that are specific to us those concepts those those precepts and so when i think about that and there's and there's particular words for it because uh brother ian himself you know after studying um knows those and he mentioned it a couple weeks ago those words that mean that exact concept i don't even know what they are maybe i ought to study more but <laughs> or listen more but this is what I got out of those further instructions in verses 2 through 6 based on the fact that that letter was written just as importantly for you and for me so bear with me as you will um, so you 3RC recipients of this letter listening to it today devote yourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful you recipient of this letter reading it pray for us and I'm going to say us your elders uh, your deacons um, your co-laborers your pastors pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which we are in chains for which we are bond servants bound up in Christ serving Christ and you recipient of this letter you reading it right now pray that we may proclaim it clearly as we should 
Now you, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Think about what you say, what you do, um, knowing that you're representing Christ to a lost world. Make the most of every opportunity. And lastly, you, recipient of this letter, these final instructions, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone in every situation. Why? <laughs> I think of the song, because uh, you're the only Jesus that some will ever see. You're the only words of life that some will ever read. So let them see in you the one in whom is all they'll ever need because you may be the only Jesus that some will ever see. I like those last minute special further instructions. That's what I favored from this book. Thank you. I should be able to get us a little back on track on time. It won't take this long at all. I first of all want to thank my Lord Jesus Christ for saving me probably about 40 years ago. I thank you for this church family that's walked with me for 30 years of it. I can see that I've come a long way, and I also see every time I come in here that I've got a long way to go. Uh, the verses that that were brought out to me during this Colossian study were 3.22 and 3.23. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are earthly, your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. 24 even says, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. Uh, at work during this study, I, was, I had what I thought was a, an unreasonable request for information from me from, from somebody I don't know. And I spent a lot of time via email texting back and forth to, to find out what they were looking for. And the, the email stopped, so I just let it go. Uh, then they came back and were uh, in a hurry to receive this information, but it had been a month since I'd last spoken to them. Well, now it's urgent for some unknown reason, and I felt it was uh, an unreasonable request, like I said, so I sent back an email and said, all of this information is, is owned by NAFAC next door, and I know that for a fact because I was part of put, placing it over there. The reason I have it is because we kept a copy. I said, you know, I, you can find it with your own government people there. Well, I included one of our bosses, and he said, and I even, I think I even said, and it's, it's beyond the scope of the contract. And he said, well, it is part of the contract, so you need to take care of it, which what didn't make me happy at all. You know, you, it was a waste of my time, I felt. And then this verse came up, and I said, you said it, I'll take care of it. And I'll do it because the Lord is the one that told me to do this. You can either take the words that you receive from the Lord and walk in them, or you can reject them. Same thing as you do with your choices every day. Uh, my, my even higher boss said, sent me an email, not in person, although we work in the same building, same area, I'll decide what's in the scope and what's not. And he's right. That is his job. I'm fine with that. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters, period. Not if you like it, not if you agree with it. We're called to do that because the Lord said so. Um, once again, I thank you for, for this church family. I especially want to thank him for provi providing me with the family that I have, uh, both my immediate family and my church family. I'm thankful that we are able to lead the church in oneness, humility, prayer, 
like-mindedness following what the Lord has for us on a daily basis. Thank you very much. to having a headset holding a microphone in your hand is very difficult to do uh, you know Ian when we were talking about this said everybody needs to pick a, a verse or two to talk about and I'm like a verse or two uh, let's re-preach the whole book that's what I could do uh, I've never been accused of being short of something to say uh, but this uh this morning, you know, we've heard from, from these guys uh, from the, the back half of, of Colossians, but I want to point us back towards the beginning to, uh, to the first chapter. I want to look at the, the last six verses of, of, of Colossians chapter 1 to look at what Paul said there. And then from those verses, I want to make a, a very personal application to it. And uh, I, I'll... I'll won't be very long in this, but I do want to make a, 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 a very pointed point, a personal point here. This is Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. Please look there uh, and read with me what the great apostle had to say there at the end of chapter 1. Paul said, Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is, the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of his what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power which mightily works within me. As a pastor, as a minister of the gospel of our Lord, these verses land heavy on me. Listen again to what Paul said there in verse 25. He said, of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. Church, I, I do not take lightly the call of God on my life as a minister of his gospel. I know me. I know how unfit I am. And if you knew me like I know me, you probably wouldn't even like me. You may not like me anyway. You know, and when God, me and Mark have both shared the same testimony. When God first called me to preach, I'm like, God, this is a horrible idea. You, you dialed the wrong number. I'm, I'm not the one. I'm not the guy you want. Amen. I mean, you, you hear me talk. I'm not very good at it. Uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm not an eloquent speak, speaker. I, I, I do have a, a lisp and a stutter and I you know, stumble through words. And I use the same argument Moses used when God met him in the burning bush. Moses is like, I, Lord, you don't want me. I can't speak. You know, I'm slow of speech. I use the exact same argument. God, you, don't, you want somebody who can who can communicate clearly and you know, speak well. And I think of these guys, these great speakers like Adrian Rogers, if you're familiar with him, you know, his voice just, you know, just rings like it's the voice of God itself when he, would, when he would preach. And as I'm arguing with God, God used the same answer he gave Moses when Moses was arguing with him. He said, did, not I, I, did I not make your mouth? And 
I don't need you to be anybody but who you are and, and be a willing vessel. And so that's all I have to offer is a willingness to serve. And I, I don't take lightly the call to be a minister of his gospel. I don't take lightly the responsibility that I have to fully carry out the preaching of his word. And, and how that directly connects to what Paul said in verse 28 where he says we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ we're to proclaim who? him and who are we to proclaim it to? every man why? so that they may be presented to God complete in Christ Jesus that's my job it's not just my job it's yours too but but you know but but it's my job it's my responsibility that's my assignment from the Lord to boldly and unapologetically proclaim the truth of God's word the, the truth of the gospel and to proclaim to proclaim this truth to, to all of mankind so that hopefully God can reap a harvest of souls from my obedience to fully carry out the preaching of his word not anything that I have done there's no power in me at all but I rest on the promise of God's word that it will not return void that it will accomplish what he sent it forth to do and so I, pre I preach God's word I proclaim the truth of God's word I, 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 I try to be diligent I spend a lot of time in study and digging into the, the Greek and Hebrew text to find out what these root words mean because what I want to be is accurate to the text. And when I step up here in this place, I want to present to you the truth of God's word, not my opinion of God's word. And so here's the very personal application that I want to make uh, from these verses. I mean, yes, of course, the call and the responsibility that has been assigned to me is personal here. But with the assignment... Here's the personal application for me. My uh, official job title here at Three Rivers is co-pastor, the pastor of missions, outreach, and evangelism. And historically, missions and, and evangelism has been the passion behind my ministry. And for reasons that I'll never understand, God has given me far more opportunities than I ever could have imagined I've had opportunities to speak and preach and, and, and teach and witness to countless people in countless places all around the world I've been blessed to, to blessed and honored to, to, to share Jesus with so many and I've, I've even had the honor of leading some of you to faith in Christ and, and for that I am, I am so thankful But over these last several weeks, God's been dealing with me and he's been showing me that I have allowed some stuff to get in the way of my first love, in the way of my passion in ministry. And as God has been working on me, I, I have dealt with God about this and now, church, I want to make the confession to you. I want to apologize to you, my church family, and ask your forgiveness because I have allowed the busyness of ministry get in the way of the love of ministry. And oh, what a difference there is. And as, as many of you know, and, and, may, and I know some of you don't, some of your visitors, but over the last few years, I've, I've taken on a number of, uh, of, a, of additional roles and responsibilities that are you know, beyond my actual job title. Five years ago, I, I assumed the leadership role of the praise team, and honestly, the team has made it such a wonderful place to serve. I love singing and playing with these guys, and a shout out to Nick, as he was saying, uh, and he has stepped in and taken a large part of that. He now puts together our, our song list, so thank you, Nick. You, you know, you helped me out tremendously with that, but I've also taken over the lead of our youth group, and I teach those guys every Sunday night, and I've taken the lead over our kids' club uh, on Wednesday night where I teach our children every Wednesday night. So 
So I've got a lot going on. Now, now please don't hear what I'm not saying. Uh, I'm not complaining, not at all. I love to serve the church. As I just said, I love being a, a part of our praise team. I love our children and having the opportunity to share with them week after week from God's word on Wednesday nights. And I, I really, really love our teenagers. Our youth have always had a very special place in my heart. And I'm so thankful for the opportunities that I've been given. So I'm not complaining. Please, please understand that. But what it does mean is I'm extremely busy. I've got a lot going on just here in the church. And when you add to that the responsibilities that I have as a dad and a husband, I've, I've really got a lot going on. But what God has shown me is I've let the busyness of it all get in the way. Going through the motions, and I've let it distract me from my first love, from my passion for missions and evangelism. And in that, what has happened is I have failed to lead our church family in these areas in the way that I should. Not that we haven't had things going on. We still have some mission work and, and things happening. Uh, but God has shown me that I have not led in the way that I should. I, I've allowed missions and outreach and evangelism to kind of take a back seat while, while I work on these other things. And for that, I am sorry, and, and I do ask for your forgiveness. The Lord has shown me afresh from these verses in Colossians 1 that, that if I'm not striving to proclaim him to all men, that I'm not fully carrying out his assignment for me. If I'm missing it. And with that, even if I fix that in my own personal life, as a minister in his church, if I'm not leading you, if I'm not encouraging you and enabling you to proclaim the Lord to all men, then I still fail in my ministry. I still fail to carry out the assignment that he has given to me. I fail to be a good steward of this precious gospel message that he has entrusted to me. So again, I'm sorry that I've allowed myself to get distracted from the call of the Great Commission in my life and from leading the church in Great Commission efforts. I'm, I'm taking steps to correct this and put missions and evangelism and outre outreach back in the forefront where it belongs. Because if we're not striving to make disciples, what are we doing? That is, that is, that is the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus did not say that we might be, could be, or even should be. He said, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So that's what I want us to do. That's what I want to lead us to do, to be about making disciples here at our church, in our community, in our state, in our nation, and in all the world. I want to ask you to join me in this effort for the sake of the kingdom of our God. So we were talking in our small group the other night, for the sake of the three billion people on this planet who've never even had the opportunity to hear the name Jesus. Just let that number sink in. Through over three billion people have never even heard his name. For the sake of the gospel, let's make it known. Let's go out into the highways and the hedges and the deepest, darkest places of the earth and let's make this message known that Jesus saves. There's only hope in the name of Jesus. And I'll end with this. Let me just remind you again of the Great Commission, remind you of the church's marching orders from our Lord found in Matthew 28, verses 18 and to through 20. The Lord said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all na nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Long time no see. Um, I'm very encouraged this morning, uh, and 
unfortunately they said to pick out the verse that meant the most to you and, and it's the it's the whole book and I can't go through the whole book it, it's a lot of verses um, but I think what you're hearing this morning you're hearing a, there's a common theme uh, each man that's come up here something that is personal that God has worked in his life so I want to encourage you when we have a moment here for you to ask questions I want you to also be considering sharing what God's word has done to you as it's been preached faithfully to you and I've watched the Holy Spirit moving in this place as we've gone through God's word and I can see growth now I'm a teacher I was slow to realize that I was going to be a teacher, but once I realized I was going to do that, I embraced that, and I've enjoyed teaching, and God's calling in my life to preach his word was simple. He, he showed me that you know you're a good teacher. The world has recognized that you've been given accolades. Why would you not teach my word? And I did not have a good answer other than I didn't want to, I didn't want the responsibility, uh, look at my sin history, God, this is a terrible idea, and I gave him a lot of objections, uh, but for all of us, God calls us to be uh, the simplest, obedient followers, and he's tasked us all to do something with the gifts and talents he's given us, so what I'd like to uh, have you consider is when you get an opportunity to ask a question for be considering what are the verses that you know right well the Holy Spirit convicted you on, encouraged you with as we we're going through this, and be brave enough to share that. And because I am a teacher and a coach, um, I like to watch people grow. It brings me great pleasure to see people grow. It, it brings me pleasure to drag them to a place of growth. Uh, this morning, I thought it would be a wonderful idea for our elders to have an opportunity to stand before you. And uh, I don't think they were super excited about standing in front of you, uh, but they've done so, uh, and they've spoken from the heart. I'm very proud of them, and uh, they do have a heart and passion for you, uh, for the church, and uh, great yearnings on them. So I'm excited to continue to see you grow, and not just you grow, but I'm excited when I share God's word because I am the first student and recipient of his word and i have grown a lot through our study in colossians and i have the pleasure of not only being able to share god's word but to sit underneath the preaching from two pastors that i greatly respect and i've watched all three of us grow and learn from each other you can see it in our preaching approaches and styles we've been a positive impact on each other one of the verses i've always loved in colossians is in Colossians chapter 1 where it describes who Jesus is and this is found in verse 15 it says the son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation for in him all things were created things in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I've always loved that verse, but in the study of Colossians, the area I've grown most is to really see the passion that Paul had for this body of people and the connection of the people in Colossae to the people in Ephesus and that entire area and that the church was absolutely plagued with false doctrine bad teaching and that stuff was coming into the church from outside the church and a lot of times we we look at that and we make assumptions that well why would one example is they were worshiping angels and we would look at that and be like well that's dumb why would you do that and it's hard for us to get our minds wrapped around their practices but there was some teaching that to be right with God, to be close to God, to be holy with God, that you had to do a whole bunch of things. You had to gain this deep knowledge. You couldn't just, by faith, trust in Jesus Christ. That wasn't enough. They were teaching things that were not the true gospel, and Paul is strongly defending that. The church, we may not have angel worship going on 
and maybe we do. Some of you are, have been worshiping angels. Stop that. But we do have stuff that leaks into the church from our culture and from our society that is at odds with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And that's where I've grown the most and been the most convicted on is not only living that out in my life, but having the passion that Paul had to make sure that he safeguards the church and to speak up when those things pull in. And as we've gone through the scripture, the reason that this scripture is stated this way, even though I've always enjoyed it, is because they've painted Jesus Christ as something other than what he was. They really believed, they let this, this process get in their church that material things were evil and spiritual things were good. So Jesus Christ could not have been a physical human being. He had to be a spiritual being that just really looked like a physical human being. That's the only way their logic and thinking can justify. And that completely takes away from the heart of the gospel message. Because Jesus Christ came and did what you and I can't do. He lived a perfect, sinless life. That's not us. Matter of fact, we are so wretched that we give our life to Jesus Christ and we proclaim that he is Lord. Like, Jesus, you're Lord. I will follow you all the days of my life. And then we take our eyes off of our walk with Jesus and we let foolishness get into our life and we look around and say what have I done God's word is so important and Paul starts off in chapter 1 before he gets this he talks about how important it is to be praying and a couple quick things I'll share with you and then I will we'll get out of the way in chapter 1 you can start with verse 3, but there's a couple of points. He asked them to be praying. And as I was really thinking about this, I grew up in a time, my dad was a minister of music, I grew up in the church. Uh, we had this thing on Wednesday nights called Wednesday night prayer meetings. Guess what they did at Wednesday night prayer meeting? They prayed. Church, can I ask us an honest question? When is the last time that we have fervently prayed together as a body of believers? I don't mean we open in prayer, we close in prayer, but we came here with the intention of just coming to pray together. Is it heavy on our hearts? If we even mention something like that, will we immediately look at our weekly schedule like, oh, I'm too busy for that. I don't know if I can fit that in. Paul says, when we're praying, how to pray for other Christians, thank God for their faith and changed lives. Ask God to help them to know the will of God. Ask God to give them spiritual wisdom and understanding. Ask God to help them live in a way that honors and pleases Him. Ask God to give them more knowledge of Himself. Ask God to give them strength for endurance and patience. Ask God to fill them with joy and thankfulness how many people in our lives in this church body would be touched if we were faithful and praying for one another like that amen thank you so i've got good news and bad news will not take any questions so here's what I want you to do because there's not enough time to do questions and do the rest of the service because uh, we are on a time schedule so here's what I want you to do if you have a question about Colossians jot that in an email and send it to ian at three rivers dot life and we will answer those questions in the new year because we've got uh, I mean I, I'm a planner so we've got the Thanksgiving 
message next week. We've got a four-week Christmas series, and Zach Womack's not here today, but he'll be bringing one of the Christmas messages, so we'll answer those in January before we start our new series in Philemon. So we'll be able to adjust things. So one of the benefits I have of going last is I can, I can speak briefly, but I can change what I was going to say because uh, one, one of my life verses, I guess, for the past 20 or 30 years has been Colossians 3, 23, whatsoever you do, do heartily as unto the Lord. Uh, since Randy, that was something that spoke to him, I can shift over very quickly to piggyback on what Mark and Zane and Bruce and Nick said that that would be all of the guys. And in Colossians chapter 3, Paul says, Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, and really it's since it should be, therefore, since you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. And I think that, for me, one of the challenges that I have as a follower of Christ, one of the challenges I have as a minister of the gospel, is to get people to think less of the now and more of the future. I think we, we spend so much time dealing with things, and Zane talked about busyness, and, and he's busy with ministry. And I think we're so focused on doing things today that we're losing sight of eternity. And none of the things, I think there are uh, many things that we do are important, but you can see the seasons of life that are very comparable with the seasons in which we live. We look forward to football season starting, and then we look forward to sweater weather, and we look forward to Christmas, and we're just going to stop at Thanksgiving for a moment so we can get to Christmas, and then baseball season comes up, and, and I forgot about fishing seasons and hunting season, and then it's travel ball time, and then there's soccer team or soccer uh, practice and soccer games, and there's dance, and there's drama, and there's course, and there's school, and there's graduations, and there's vacation time, and all these things are important to us. But we lose sight of eternity because we're too concerned about making sure our kids are on the honor roll or get accepted into the, the uh, whatever honor society they might be. And I think if we were to focus just a little more, and I'm not saying, and, and I'll say what I'm saying, I love that saying, don't hear what I'm not saying, but when you spend, you know, when you stand before the Lord, Now, now I'm going to be like you. When you stand before the Lord and he says, what have you done with my son? And you say, well, Lord, my kid was on the travel ball team. My kid was in the, the cheer team and they cheered and they were in drama and they're on the honor roll. And, and, and Lord, I shot a 16-point buck and I caught a 12-pound bass, and my team won the national championship four times in a row. And he's going to say, what have you done with my son? And many people are going to stand before him, and he's going to say, you're going to say, Lord, I did all this stuff for you. I taught Sunday school. I, I did this, I did this. And he's going to say, I never knew you. Because if you keep reading in that passage, Paul talks about the things that were formerly us, the things that we put aside in favor of the new creation that we've become in Christ. Old things are passed away. You've become new in Jesus Christ. New attitude, new goals, new vision, new mission. And while Zane may have failed in his mind, the church, I wonder how many have stepped up in the gap to your tired and weary elders, your tired and weary pastors, and said, look, there's a little gap right here, a little hole. Zane's had to step up. Mark's had new responsibilities. I'm going to step in, and I'm going to fill the gap. I will stand in the gap, and I will serve because that's what Jesus Christ has called all of us to do. 
what are we doing to stand in the gap between heaven and hell? I look around this room and I think of the hundreds of people that you can reach that I'll never have an opportunity to talk to Jesus about. I can't be Jesus in the flesh to them because I'll never cross paths. You've been given such a tremendous privilege and honor to be the light of the world, to share the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. That's what this letter is all about. Dealing with the things that we deal with, knowing we have to go to work in the morning. Actually, we, we get to go to work. We've got a job. What are we doing to stand in the gap? Because I tell you, we're way better together than with just us six, with Zach. Unfortunately, Zach had to be out of town. What are we doing to stand in the gap? Stronger together. Seven years ago, we came together with a motto, the motto that we are better together. And we are. In fact, we can't do it without you. We work together, we serve together, we praise the Lord together in good times and in bad, and we see him work out the details. And I'm excited about what he's going to do. I'm excited. Are you excited? Have you been challenged in this letter? And we'd love to hear your challenges, we'd love to hear your praises, and we're going to talk about them in January. Will you pray with me? Father, we're so grateful, so glad, so humbled that we get to play a part in your plan, in your design. Lord, each of us has a part to play. Each of us has a role that you have gifted us in, areas that you've given us talents Lord, I pray we never take for granted that somebody else will do what you've called us to do. Lord, each of us can play a part in serving the kingdom of God and making your name known and making your name glorious, praising your name, living a life devoted to you. So Lord, work in us, work through us, and Father, we'll give you the glory, honor, and praise because you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. What a gift of grace Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is only bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, not I, but through Christ in The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stand. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold.
Jesus, for he had said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before. Darkness slain, 
then bursting forth in glorious day from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory sin's curse has lost sin's grip on me for I am his and he is mine but with the precious calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand thank you church for being flexible thank you uh, thank you for your graciousness uh, don't forget our Thanksgiving service downtown at the waterfront park bring a blanket or a chair and that'll be at 4 o'clock at the waterfront park so let's pray, uh, pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, thank you for all that has been accomplished. Lord, I thank you for the, the words that have been spoken from the heart of, of your pastors and leaders at this church. Lord, I pray that the power of God, the word of God, would richly dwell in each of us, making a difference in our lives that would be obvious and evident to a community and a world that desperately needs to hear the hope that's found in Jesus. Now, Lord, as we leave this place, I pray that we would be doers of God's word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen.